Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, today we're going to discuss cancer. Now, if there's anybody out there who hasn't been affected by cancer, either yourself, a close relative or friend, well, I think you must be quite unique. I mean, it's not, and it's not just that we're getting older, which I'll give you as a factor, but it's affecting children too. I mean, the incidence is rising over the last few decades, and it's not just that we've got improved diagnosis. The incidence of cancer has gone up somewhere between 25 and 30%, allowing for the increase in age. So what is cancer? How common is it? I discussed this today with my guest, Dr. Jochen Fleurer, who has been an integrative medical practitioner with over 40 years of clinical experience and a specialised interest in cancer, specifically monitoring the progress, positive or otherwise, after a diagnosis and in particular after treatment. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Jochen Fleurer. Welcome to the show, Jochen. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for having me. Now, Jochen, um, cancer is a pretty big topic. I think that be it would be unusual for any person listening to not either have had direct contact with it themselves or at least one degree of separation. Could we just go back to some basics? What is cancer? Yes. What's actually going on when someone well, can gets we diagnosed? We use the term generically for diseases which involve malignant growth. And that, that means there's some growth of cells, could be organs, could be tissue, could be brain, which grow uncontrollably. And that causes um, usually tumors in the blood. It causes just um, plenty of cells which crowd out other cells, but it's uncontrollable growth of cells which then interfere with the normal function of the body and, and you know, in some cases can, can cause the person to die as a result of it. Mm. So, for example, um, you know, within a liver, there are cells that are specific to liver function, but when a yeah. cancer comes in, it's, it means they're taking over what is normally fu normal functioning cells. Yeah, so any cell in the body, like we know, for example, in the liver, you can, you can cut out part of the liver and the liver replaces back to its normal size and normal function. The skin can do that too. Right? Mm. So that's normal and that's built into every cell. Now, if that process of damage, if you like, is not normal, like, you know, we get damaged to our skin, for example, by getting out in the sun and getting wet skin and getting damaged, then we expect that these cells repair back to normal. But sometimes the damage is that much that the repair process doesn't go normally and we have then damaged cells which survive. And if they grow uncontrollably, then we can call it malignancy or cancer or tumour. Mm. And uh, the difference between malignant and benign, of course, is, uh, well... So each one can produce a tumour, which means a growth, but yeah. a malignant growth is something that has got particular features when you look at the cells themselves but they can go and grow outside the cells and go into a distant organ um, or distant tissue and cause another tumour. We call that metastasis, and that's malignant. Now, when we hear about it, and I, yeah. I, I heard this statistic where one in two men and one in three women contract cancer and all this, we, we kind of often dismiss it as, oh, we're just getting older, but it's not really the case, is it? I mean, what, how common is this problem? Well, in Australia, and, and you can have a look at the Australian Government Cancer Australia website. It's called cancerAustralia.gov.au, where the numbers are. So it says that in 2017, the expectation is that 134,000 people will be diagnosed with a new cancer. In Australia? In Australia, 134,000 this year. Wow. And... That means then, and there's also another number, which is people living with cancer, which have been diagnosed in the five years and living with it are 410,000 people in Australia. So that's a very significant number. Mm -hmm. Well, as somebody who has been, uh, I can put my hand up to that. But it's even, uh, it's not just affecting older people, is it? I mean, it's not just that we're getting older. No, it's not just, obviously, you know, if we have 
in increasing population and increasing aging population, then we have increased number of uh, uh, cancers being diagnosed. However, we also get increasing number of younger people being diagnosed with cancers and malignancies. And that is not yet clear what that is all due to, but there are obviously various suggestions of what might that be. Hmm. But what do you think is going on? Why is this disease so ubiquitous? Well, is, you know, I just referred to another um, Australian website, the Cancer Council website. That's cancercouncil.com.au. And that says that one in three cancers are preventable. So that means they put the number at 37,000 of those 134,000 people are preventable. So that means that we do contribute or not contribute to that number of people being diagnosed. So one third are, you know, and it says here smoking is obviously something that everyone knows. Then the other ones is drinking too much alcohol, being overweight, a lack of physical activity, eating too much red and processed meat, and not eating enough fruit and vegetables. These are the preventable, these are the ones which cause the preventable cancers. So, and I think our, our modern lifestyle uh, is including all of that. Weight is a big problem, lack of physical activity is a big problem, not eating enough fruit and vegetables is a, you know, an ongoing problem. You know, so these are preventable causes. And and I'm kind of you know we also hear about autoimmune diseases and and I and there's a kind of genetic component to how these diseases manifest itself. I mean, if the cause is similar, it manifests itself in, in skin cancer, in lung cancer, in liver cancer. Now, yeah. Is that the genetic component? Do you think, or are there actual uh, triggers that predispose us to particular cancers? Yes. So we have to dist when we talk about genetics, we have to then distinguish between so-called inherited diseases, which are inherited from our parents or from our ancestry, these are the minority of cancers and diseases. Mm. The majority of the genetic changes are genetic changes which have happened during our lifetime. So that means that certain things, and we can talk about those, can damage our genes, and if that's not being repaired, together with other factors can cause the cancer. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have through very to environmental influences, we have DNA or genetic damages going on every day, all the time. That's normal. And then we have processes built into our cells, which are designed to repair those damages or if those damages cannot be repaired, if it's too much, then those cells should die. And this is a normal process. If that balance between DNA damage or genetic damage, and they're called then mutations, if these mutations, these cells cannot be repaired or not be controlled, and the cells can't die, then those damaged cells with mutations um, can then live and survive and they, they then grow and sometimes uncontrollably. So we have the process going on every day, every minute of our day, there is, a, there is damage to our genes, damage to our DNA and repair of our DNA. And then there are various trigger factors like the, like the obesity and the smoking and the eating of meat and uh, too much radiation or sun exposure, um, not eating enough food and vegetables, all of those areas are, in, are involved firstly in doing the genetic changes, but also on the positive side, if you do it right, helping us to repair those genetic changes so now, we don't get tumors. Now diagnostically, when we come to diagnose a cancer, what are we looking at? I mean, is it, is it blood tests? Is it scans? Is it, how is cancer diagnosed? Traditionally, the ultimate diagnosis is when you have a piece of tissue under a microscope and the pathologist looks at them and he or she will say, these are cancer cells. And so the, the way to get there is usually that we have a lump. Now we can feel a lump 
you know, it's in the breast or somewhere on, you know, on the leg or, or you know, on the back, you know, and then we have it diagnosed. This is one way of uh, finding um, a cancer, but saying not every lump is cancer. So we need to go and take a piece of tissue and um, uh, call the biopsy, and then we put it under microscope and uh, we can diagnose it. The other way is by doing scanning. So these are the imaging, these are x-rays or CT scans or MRIs, and we can then see cancers or tumors which are maybe one, uh, you know, five to six millimeters in size. That's what we can detect on those scans. If they are smaller than that, we cannot see them. Now, there is the newer identification of systems which are more sensitive than that, who detect tumors at an earlier stage, and these are what's called liquid biopsies. So the, the, any growing tumor will shed information that's called DNA or proteins or whole cells into the bloodstream and we can identify those. So through a normal blood test, um, you can now find DNA particles, you can find tumor cells, you can find proteins, you can find RNA, and these are all these omics, you know, genomics, metabolomics, proteonomics, these are methods to identify these particles or whole cells in the bloodstream. And that will lead to an earlier an earlier and uh, diagnosis, an earlier detection. Yeah, because the scanning uh, uh, one, which is, uh, they do what they do, PET scans, where they inject uh, radiosensitive or I yeah. isotopes of, of sugar because cancer cells love glucose. Isn't that, isn't that one of the tests that are done? Yes, yeah, so you can do you know, x-ray kind of things, uh, which are CT scans, and then you, you have magnetic fields. They're called magnetic um, field testing, MRIs. And then you have radioisotopes. So you can label or lace particular molecules. And in this part, what you said, the PET scans is sugar, a sugar molecule, glucose molecule, with a radioisotope and they inject it in the body and you can then with a particular camera see where these molecules go. Now we know that the tumors have a higher glucose turnover um, and so they accumulate in those places where the tumors are um, and you can diagnose it. So this testing is used not as a screening test but as a, as a kind of a staging test when someone is being diagnosed to see if there are any other tumours around in the body. So <clears throat> this other test, this liquid biopsy test, where we're taking blood tests yeah. and looking for markers, if we looked at a, well, if there is such a thing as a normal population, people will always have these kind of things circulating around their body, uh, markers that well, there is some yeah. mutation going on. Are we in danger of over it, it is, an, it is a, Yeah, it is an important and interesting question in there. There's still, uh, you know, a debate out if you go in the scientific world. Now, just as a background, we know that a tumor, a malignant tumor, which is, say, one cubic millimeter in size, so it's like a pinhead, has got one million cells in it. So the, the numbers are quite huge. Mm. And a, a tumor which is one cubic centimeter in size, can shed, an active tumor can shed 100,000 cells into the bloodstream on any given day. Mm. So these are large numbers of cells, but the majority of these cells which go into the bloodstream, they don't survive that and they, they die within a short period of uh, time, maybe hours. <laughs> Only those which have got the capacity to survive, these are, we call them cancer stem cells, uh, can survive. So. The aim is now in this, um, in this world of early detection and screening to identify cells or particles in the bloodstream coming from tumors. If you then take any of these liquid biopsies, and we're talking about cells, they're called circulating tumor cells or circulating DNA or proteins or RNA, the question is, is that related to the tumor? And that comes back to your question. So if we take 
and that's done with that uh, that one technology, the, the the main track CDC technology, which if you take healthy medical students and look at the number of cells they have in the in the bloodstream, it's only three percent of them. Three percent of those medical students have low levels of these cells in the bloodstream. So low levels um, of these circulating tumor cells. Yes. So 3%, yes. if there is such a thing as a healthy medical student, 3% yes. of these healthy medical students have some circulating tumour, or this is the have some circulating CT, tumor cells, CTC yes. you mentioned is standard CTC. for cir circulating yeah. tumour cells. Okay. Yeah. If I take then another group, say 50 to 70-year-old people who have a higher risk, either through family history of cancers or through personal risk factors like smoking or obesity and so forth, the ones we talked about before. Mm -hmm. If you take them, that's about, then we have 65% of those people, that's a high number, have got circulating tumor cells in their bloodstream. Mm. Mm. Right? Okay. So what we then did is then looked at these people and if we, if we take um, those which have high numbers of those cells in the bloodstream, and then did scanning, we found that about 60% again of those with high numbers, we then could find small cancers in their, in, in their body and they could be surgically removed. So this is early detection. Now I must say to you, this is a new technology, this is a new application of these circulating tumor cell testing. These numbers are currently being reviewed for publication so this is a new area. The question is, should we use it as a screening? And you know, this needs to be sorted out in the long term. But what is really very useful is those people who have been diagnosed with a malignancy, who have had successful treatment like removal of the lump and surgery and had treatments, and then look at this area of prevention of recurrences. Because Ron, as you, as you know, the, the majority of people, you know, hardly ever dies from the primary cancer. Hmm. People die from the recurrence of cancer. So what's so important is to prevent the recurrences of cancers. Hmm. And that's where these biological markers, if these cells or proteins or the genetics of it can help us uh, detecting if that person is at risk or are the treatments, the preventative treatments that we do are they working or not working? Mm. Because That's where we can make a big difference. Yeah, because, I mean, as you say, it's the metastases or the spreading of the cancer that's the problem, and the way the metastases yes. spread is via the bloodstream. So it would... Via well, the lymphatic system and the bloodstream, yeah. Lymphatic system yeah. and the bloodstream. So yeah. it would... Yeah. It would well, say, and they're sort of connected, you know. Yeah, yeah. Also. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this. So we uh, can find them. And and have there studies been done with these circulating tumor cell detections that lifestyle changes? I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a surgical intervention or something. It can be uh, a lifestyle change that has a positive impact on these circulating tumor cells. Has there been studies to show that these interventions then reduce without going into surgery or chemo or any of that other? Well. Studies have not been done using circulating tumor cell as a marker for that. But we know statistically, on average, that people who increase physical activity, have you know, stopped smoking, uh, reduced their alcohol, increasing fruits and vegetables, all of those, which we also have in primary prevention, will also be valuable and beneficial in secondary prevention, so preventing of metastases. Yeah. Now, tumor cells, cancers, love or, or metabolize sugar at a higher rate, and that's why we use those kind of uh, markers in PET scans. But they also they thrive in a more acidic environment too, don't they? Yeah, they thrive in an environment which is compromised, if you like. Yeah. So if it's too much sugar, if it's too many toxins, if it's deficient in things, if it's the acid-alkaline balance is not right then the cells grow and they can, can be stimulated. Now, you know, we need to put some you know, note on that, that a tumor which has 
established itself, uh, creates its own environment, and it will it will not follow the channel bodies and environment. So it's difficult with an existing tumor to look at lifestyle changes and then get rid of that tumor. So if we use the lifestyle choices as a prevention to get recurrences, I think that's where the, 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 the issue mainly is. But some people try to, if they've been diagnosed with metastasis, for example, or with a, with a large primary tumor, through lifestyle changes to get rid of that existing tumor. And that's very difficult. Mm. So idea, in the ideal setting, one would, if there is a, if there is a tumor, one would, one would remove it and then do all these active things to prevent recurrences. Now, it becomes slightly more complicated going on there because some cancers are fast-growing ones and others are slow-growing ones. And we know that slow-growing cancers, and we talk about prostate cancers, and we talk about breast cancers, of what, what we know, they may not need any treatment. Mm. Yeah. Right? They may not need um, you know, significant treatment. So, and we... we strive to understand which ones are fast growing and which ones are slow growing tumors. The, the identification of genetics and proteins and all of those, what we can do for example through liquid biopsies can help us identifying slow growing or fast growing tumors. So I mean where we're kind of headed is a kind of a personalized approach to healthcare really, isn't it? I mean it's one thing to say all of these tumours are one thing, but, but how they react within an individual is the big challenge. So this personalised approach to medicine is where we're headed. Absolutely. I think that everyone is, you know, in the scientific world and in the medical world is very excited about this direction from the uh, statistical average kind of approach to focused individual um, diagnostic and response to therapy approach called precision medicine or personalized medicine or individualized medicine. So you know, the classic clinical trials that we have had, they harvest a handful of measurements from a thousand of people, just a few measurements. Right? Mm. So the precision medicine, the personalized medicine requires a different way. So you get a lot of factors, you get the genetic factors, the DNA, the mutations, the various pathways, the proteins, the environment, the acid alkaline balance, as you said, and the oxidation and the oxidation level, all of that needs to be analyzed in order to find the individual responses for that one person. That's, you know, that's obviously the desired end bit in this journey from coming from a statistical average to a personalized approach. You, you shared with me, and I'll share this article with our listeners, but you shared with me this great uh, article <coughs> in Nature magazine, and it kind of highlighted how some very common um, medications, drugs that are, in fact, the 10 biggest drugs uh, that are sold globally, the number needed to treat is a really sobering uh, statistic. Can you explain the minimum number needed to treat, that um, measure? Yes, yeah, so you know, if, if I give you a medicine, then now I don't have a comparison. It either works for you or it doesn't, but I don't know if it would be due to the medicine or because of something else. So I need to get an, a number of people and give the medicines to them and then see the response. So this is the number to treat for one person to get the benefit. And that for these medicines that you just mentioned is between one in four and one in 24. So for example, there are medicines for, for heartburn, common medicines that we use, and you can see that in the, in the article it's mentioned there is Nexium. Um, so we, we need to give it to 24 people for one person to really benefit. The problem has been, Ron, that we don't know which one of those 24 will get the benefit. Yes. So we have to give to 24 for one to benefit. And our challenge is to identify that one person who would benefit from it and then give it to them and not give it to the other 23. 
Yeah. And hence this importance of this personalised approach to medicine because it's yes. kind of a shotgun approach at the moment, isn't it? Or actually a machine gun approach. You're just kind of spraying bullets out there to everybody and uh, hoping that we get, we get the results, but we, we don't actually. It's quite sobering to see. I'll have that article on, online. It's an interesting one. Yes, it's worthwhile, worthwhile reading. And uh, no, I, I think we, it comes from our from our clinical trial study. So we're using large number of people, measuring a few measurable outcomes and looking for the average response of all of those people. Mm. Like I get a thousand people, I give them a medication, and I give a thousand people a placebo or a sugar pill or, or something, and then compare the results. Now, if the statistics tell me that the people who were given the medication had a benefit, and this is a statistical number, um, and we can argue about that, but there is some discussion in, the, in, in this paper about that. So if the statistical benefit is there for these people, who these thousands who get the medication, then the drug may get approved to be used for people in that situation. Mm. But if you then look at these thousand people, then what we need to identify the people who really, who really get, did get the benefit. Yeah? And for this one medication, it's one in 24, and for others, it's one in 12, or the best may be one in four. So this is our challenge. And everyone wants to do better on this, and that's where everyone is excited about this uh, uh, precision medicine and personalized medicine. Mm. Now, so, Jochen, before we finish, I, the one thing I, I like to ask all my guests is, what do you think the biggest challenge is that people face on their health journey today? You know, not just in cancer, but in, in general, as they're trying to be healthy and well. What do you think people's biggest challenge is? I think the, the biggest challenge is, is to, to be disciplined but not fundamentalistic about one's own health approach. And we often go against the, the trend of what's out there and what's on offer. And we have to be strong. You know, like, I, you know, it's now, it's now Christmas time and there is time of giving and, um, and sometimes indulgence and at, at that time. And I, I remember when I was younger, we had maybe one piece of chocolate, you know, maybe every two weeks that was a special treat. Now, you know, we have abundance of chocolates. It's not, you know, who is going to have just one piece, one small piece of chocolate every two weeks. So we eat, we eat differently. Uh, so that's one issue. It's about the eating. It's not just about chocolate. Um, a little bit of chocolate can be beneficial for you, as, you're, as you know. Um, there is, our environment has changed. You know, there are some statistics saying we are adding 12,000 new chemicals into our environment. Now, how, how do they affect us? But the big issue, which we all know about, is, is obesity in our, um, in our population. And that is connected to huge risk factors, not just in cancer, but also in arthritis and diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, all these chronic diseases. So it's, our, it's, so it's eating and it's exercise and it's maintaining, maintaining weight. It's one of the biggest issues, I think in that area. The other one is the mind, um, which is important also. We get bombarded with, uh, with thoughts and influences on our thoughts at all times, and we need to be mindful of what we're allowing to get in our, into our head and what's swirling around there. Well, that's, that's great. I hope uh, this conversation we've had has provided some thoughts thing, and things to swirl around in our listeners' heads. But um, thank, you. thank you so much uh, today for joining me, Jochen. Thank you, Ron, for having me. All the best. So, cancer are cells that have mutated, and those cells would normally die. It's a process that goes on throughout our lives. But when things go out of balance, those cells don't die. In fact, they proliferate and they start to affect the function of a particular organ they're proliferating in. But more importantly, if these cells proliferate and then go on to spread throughout the body, that's a process called metastases, then as Joachim noted, it's those metastases that usually pose the greatest threats. 
Now, it's interesting that we're moving towards a more personalized approach to medicine. Uh, the study I was referring to is in Nature magazine in April 2018, and, oh no, 2015, and we'll have the links to that on our webpage. So what it does is it looks at the 10 most commonly prescribed drugs, medications, what are called blockbusters. And why are they called blockbusters? Because they bring in more than $1 billion a year in revenue for the drug company. That's what defines a blockbuster. Now, this is an example of how medications are prescribed across the board to those with a diagnosis. But the more important question is, how many people need to take the drug before we actually see a benefit? So it's referred to as the number needed to treat, to obtain a health benefit. So putting that into perspective, <clears throat> well, let's look at Nexium. Nexium is a protein pump inhibitor which is taken for reflux or heartburn. Now, sure, it will affect stomach acid. But the key question is, does it benefit a person's health? Well, it turns out that in Nexium's case, only 1 in 24 people actually see a health benefit. Now, what about statins? Yes, it definitely lowers cholesterol, but does it benefit a person's health? In this case, turns out it's 1 in 20. I think the article is really well worth reading. So a more personalised approach to medicine is medicine's biggest challenge, and people are definitely rising to that challenge. Now, I'll have links to Joachim's website regarding those circulating tumour cell testing. I'm actually doing it myself, and I'll have links to that. Now, also another thing that's always intrigued me is that we know cancer cells love glucose. I mean, that's why they inject radioactive glucose uh, when you've got cancer, and because they know though that it takes cancer cells takes up glucose preferentially, and then they look at the scan and see where the cancer is, provided the cancer's big enough. So if you've been diagnosed with cancer as I have, well, what do you do? Well, you could completely outsource the problem and hope for the best, or you could take control and improve the environment in your body. And that specifically means the sugar, or rather how many carbs you're taking, that quickly get broken down into glucose, uh, that's a pretty big issue. Now, in past podcasts, we've talked to integrative cardiologist Dr. Ross Walker, who identified that cardiovascular risks are greatly increased when insulin goes out of balance. We've also talked to Dr. Gary Fetke, who identified that cancer cells thrive in a high insulin environment, not surprisingly, given those PET scan or those body scans. We know that those cancer cells love radioactive glucose, so it's fairly safe to say they probably like glucose or carbs, full stop. So it would seem like a good place to start, reducing your insulin levels, reducing also Body acidity might be another thing to look at, and it's why vegetables, particularly those with lots of colours, always comes up time and time again in almost every health condition. Now, as much as I enjoy a drink, we need to remind ourselves that alcohol, um, and this is all about body acidity, um, makes the body more acidic. So that needs to be factored in as well because body acidity and high insulin levels, high carb intake are all go often hand in hand. Now, sorry, I don't buy that resveratrol in red wine. I mean, it sounds good for all those people that love drinking red wine. I could be wrong, but I just, I just can't believe it. I did hear one study which said we needed to drink about 2,000 litres of, of wine or 100 litres of wine a day to get the resveratrol health benefits. And, of course, then you've got the super supplement. But I don't want to go into that now. I think the idea of picking up circulating tumour cells is also very interesting. Stay tuned to my Facebook and blog posts because I'm awaiting my own results. I'll keep you posted. As you may know, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer two years ago. It was the more virulent type, but fortunately it hadn't spread. I had surgery and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to be doing some programs on men's health in general and this issue in particular in the future. But I'm also going to check out my circulating tumour cells and I'll let you know more about it. Anyway, there's a lot to think about there. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well.
This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak 